everyone. I'm Brooks Marmot. I am a postdoc at the Mershon Center. And perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, my historical scholarship focuses on Zimbabwe. So a very warm uh, Friday afternoon welcome to you all, uh, somewhat literally, I guess, to In the Shadow of Empire, exploring the National Archives of Zimbabwe. Uh, so this event is supported by the Global Arts and Humanities Discovery Fund, which for this academic year is Archival Imaginations. Uh, this is the first of two speaker events. Uh, so I hope to see you all on April 18th. We'll have Emanuela Hama, a PhD candidate at the History Department at the University of Purdue, speaking on Ghana and transnational archival research. Uh, so just a few brief remarks. I'll introduce the speakers, and then we'll get into everything. So the sort of essential context for this uh, series is that historians of colonial era Africa uh, struggle mightily with their, their source materials, and that's namely um, overwhelmingly one-sided uh, imperial origins of written documentation. So this series aims to unpack that dynamic and perhaps even uh, suggest some ways to uh, go beyond those, those conflicts. In the uh, spirit of the imagination dimension of the discovery theme, I've given the speakers fairly wide leeway for the remarks, uh, but I think we'll hear some material about um, the case of Chase Barney, PhD candidate in research, perhaps from both of them, some insights on the operations of the National Archives of Zimbabwe, and then perhaps just more generally um, some thoughts on the intense 90-year um, colonial occupation of Zimbabwe and its ongoing impact on historical narratives and research. So I think each speaker will take uh, more or less 15 to 20 minutes, and we'll do questions after both of them have pre presented. Uh, so Lawrence, uh, to my immediate left, is our first speaker, Lawrence Nkusha. Uh, we first met in 2018. I was doing PhD research at National Archives in Zimbabwe, and he, funny enough, told me he was gearing up to move to, to Ohio. Um, I actually was living in the UK then, so um, didn't mean anything at the time. When I saw about the discovery theme, and I knew that Lawrence was still here, I thought he would be a great person to come out and speak on National Archives of Zimbabwe. We're very lucky to have him. Um, he's just added a newborn baby to his family, so I appreciate you coming out with that. Uh, he holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in archaeology from the University of Zimbabwe. Uh, he also has experience uh, with the Zimbabwe Republic Police. He then transferred to the National Archives of Zimbabwe, where he was a research archivist from 2015 to 2019, and he's currently a teaching assistant at the Anthropology Department at Kent State. Second speaker at the end of the table is Chase Barney. Um, he is ABD, the University of Arkansas History Department, based here in Columbus. Um, my sort of reading of his scholarship, he's at the intersection of sort of social and economic history, and his dissertation examines the presence of non-white domestic workers and their families, and the upscale, essentially segregated suburbs of colonial Harare, Zimbabwe's capital. And he is one of very few, perhaps only that I can think of, um, U.S. historian like the past decade or so to get uh, long-term research clearance in Zimbabwe. And uh, with that, I will step aside and turn it over to Lawrence. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Oh, like I said, my name is Lawrence Mukusha. Um, I'm a former archivist at the National, Archive, uh, at the National Archives of Zimbabwe uh, from 2018, from 2015 to 2019. So, when I started working at the National Archives of Zimbabwe, I didn't want to work there. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go to school. Um, but then upon enrolling at the National Archives, I realized that that was the best place to be for someone uh, who want to study because there is access to everything you can think of in terms of historical documents, 
in terms of books. So I had a good five-year time at the National Archives. Of course, not earning any degree, but acquiring a lot of information. I really wish to be some time back soon in the National Archives. So uh, to start with, um, we are here going to talk about decolonization. And for it to be probably a little bit clearer, uh, I've decided to put this slide of Great Zimbabwe, showing how uh, much success has been achieved uh, culturally by uh, Zimbabweans uh, in the form of these big structures as Great Zimbabwe. So these are just a, a community that lived here around 12th century AD with a uh, principal focus on um, kettles as an economic basis. And gold was also taken from here. So this is the valley complex, which was interpreted as having been for the royal wives. And uh, this is uh, the hill complex, which, is, which was meant for the kings. So the hill complex had a lot of um, animal bones, especially that of cattle. And these bones were those of tender cattle, not hard to chew, meant for the king. Uh, back to the National Archives. Um, National Archives of Zimbabwe is a, department, is a government department under the Ministry of Heritage Preservation. Uh, it currently operates under the legal framework of National uh, Archives Act, Chapter 25.06 uh, of 1986. Its responsibility um, is the acquisition, preservation, and provision of access uh, to Zimbabwe's documentary heritage. I was so privileged to be on the forefront of uh, providing access to this um, uh, to this documentary heritage as a research archivist. So types of documents that are given access to at the National Archives, um, they are public archives. Public archives are doc those documents that would have been created within government departments, uh, parastatals, and local councils. And then we, have, we also have uh, historical manuscripts uh, we call them MS series because that is the uh, starting letters for if you want to uh, get access to these records. So these are records of historical significance created by private organizations like church missionaries, uh, NGOs, and again individuals like Rhodesian celebrated heroes like Alan Wilson, Frederick Cotton Selou, David Livingstone, Thomas Baines, uh, Robert Moffat. <coughs> Among these, uh, this list I can just sing out here, uh, Frederick Courtney Salou. Frederick Courtney Salou was one guy who went into Zimbabwe early in the 19th century. Uh, he went there and went to Lobengula, who was the overall king uh, of uh, both Matebeleland and Mashonaland. He was 20 years old, asking for a permission to hunt elephants. And the king was so surprised that such a young uh, boy can ask to hunt such big uh, mammoth. So he just gave him the permission. And he went around uh, moving all over the place, taking notes on the geography of the area, rivers, and everything related to geography that you may think of. And he killed a lot of animals, especially elephants, estimate of which more than thousands, selling tasks to whoever wanted them. So it is this guy who then rose when he was colonizing Zimbabwe, chose for guidance uh, in their trip to, to now Harare, he knew every place, he knew every mountain, he knew every river. So the other things that are also found at the National Archives are daily newspapers. Every day, newspapers, printed newspapers come to the archives and they are sorted into boxes uh, and also published book. Every book that is published in Zimbabwe 
you get the ISBN number from, from the National Archives. So it's a very good repository of books. So Arch National Archives is composed of a number of sections within it as a department. Firstly, it is the record center, which has responsibilities of keeping semi-current records for government departments. What I mean by semi-current records is that a government department creates a file today, and at some point it will close it. After close it, it will always, at some other points in time, refer to those, to those files. But then the challenge of keeping them might be bigger so that's the purpose of the record center. Those departments, those offices will send those records to the uh, record center so that whenever they need them, they just go there and request them. <coughs> so they are kept there uh, up to 25 years from the date of its closure. And thereafter, it becomes a public record, which is then transferred to the research section where I spent my five years in. <coughs> so this is the research section. It re receives records from the record center, which are public archives. It also receives uh, historical manuscripts from different organizations like churches, schools, and NGOs. <coughs> when I was there, uh, I received uh, many documents from individuals, Rhodesians, who were aging, who were in possession of some records of value. So, they were just afraid that, oh, guy, if I die now, what would happen to these documents? So just keep them. At one point, uh, a certain guy, uh, Rhodesian, came to me with a bunch of documents about uh, on a company that existed in uh, Rhodesia called Cybergay. This company was a chemical company uh, that produced company for agriculture and so forth. And then, all of it, uh, fortunately, I scrolled through the archives. I realized that that company was not only responsible uh, for providing agricultural chemicals, it also provided Ian Smith, who was um, the former, <coughs> the last colonial ruler of Zimbabwe, with chemicals to use against. Uh, guerrilla rebels, those who were termed terrorists then, but then uh, who were fighting for freedom. So what would happen is that someone, in most cases, those people were desperate. They were guerrillas, always running, running uh, from the police or any law uh, enforcement organization. So they would get help from the local community, shop owners. So this company, provided chemicals which would then be mixed with clothes, which those gorillas would then be given in the name of help. Some of them, if you see the pictures, they are bad, all the skin off. And so just an example of uh, manuscripts. So processing, the other uh, row of um, the research section is to process those records from the record center uh, and assigning them numbers so that it is easy to access them. Then we have the library section. It provides ISBN number for all publications within and on Zimbabwe. It gives, it uh, also keeping and giving access to published works in Zimbabwe and about Zimbabwe. Uh, it is the responsibility of this library section to sort the newspapers which we have talked about. <coughs> and then the audiovisual section, it collects and keeps all audiovisual records and also pictures. And then lastly, the conservation section, it de determines the preservation conditions of records and when they need restoration, it's their responsibility to restore them. <coughs> So here is the National Archives. I don't know how this will work, but I can use my hand. This is the record center, which was built uh, in the post-colonial period. Uh, this is the library section. 
and this is the um, the repository where all the public archives which had been processed are uh, kept. And these are just offices there. And this is the, the red uh, building one is the auditorium where we do our uh, functions. Yeah, this is basically the, national, the area of view of the National Archives of Zimbabwe. So background. Um, colonization, it all started with colonization. We have this guy, Cecil John Rhodes, with his dream of painting the, the war of Africa red, starting from here, Cape Town, where he was the prime minister. He had the ambitions of taking all this area in between uh, to be uh, British colonies. So in 1888, they secured the right concession, uh, which is a treaty that Rhodes and his company BSSC signed with local chief Lobengula in order to be granted a royal charter. So they were then granted this royal charter, but the agreement they signed, they dishonored everything that they had agreed to do uh, in this uh, treaty. So in September 1890, with the guidance of Frederick Cotton Salou, which we have just talked about, they were able to reach Harare and uh, raise the Union Jack on the 12th of September, uh, 1890. And the country was named Southern Rhodesia after Sisu John Rhodes. So this initiated the British South Africa Company rule in uh, Southern Rhodesia from, uh, which, from 1890 to 1923. So in 1923, from 1890 to 1923, uh, Southern Rhodesia as the country was being run by a company which had been given the permission to do so by the royal family from Britain. So in 1923, they held a referendum where those white settlers were given an opportunity to choose whether to be independent in Zimbabwe or to be a province part of South Africa. And they chose to be independent. So that's how uh, the responsible government then started from 1923 as an independent Southern Rhodesia. So on the termination of the uh, BSAC administration, uh, in 1923, all records of the company were to remain in the offices where they had accrued or were taken over by new government departments uh, created under responsible government. These were divided in, into three categories. Uh, those of local administrative value, but different historical importance were sent to the companies in London offices. Unfortunately, these records were later on destroyed during um, Hitler's bombings of 1942 in London. They were all lost. So those of local interest to new uh, government departments in the then Salisbury were preserved. Many deemed to be of little value and unimportant were destroyed. So slightly more than a decade in 1935, records generated by the BSSC administration posed a storage challenge so in response to that, they formed the National Archives Act of 1935, uh, which in instantly started operating under the first archivist called Hila. Its fundamental basis came into fall upon the termination of the British South Africa administra Company Administration of Rhodesia and the consequent, uh, consequent establishment of the responsible government. So in 1953, the archives assumed the role of protecting federal archives. Uh, colonists in these three countries, Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia, and Nyasaland, which is now Malawi, Northern Rhodesia, it's Zambia, and Southern Rhodesia, it's Zimbabwe. They formed a federation uh, for main advantages, some were political, some were economic, and I think those were the major uh, advantages of creating this uh, political system, which 
lasted not many years, but only a decade. And during this period, the War Federation acquired a lot of records, which are now, some of which are in the National Archives of Zimbabwe. In this country, sometimes claim this, uh, ownership of these records, but it's a challenge to take them back to their countries. So now back to the question, the lingering colonial legacy. Um, 43 years, years after independence in 1980, the National Archives of Zimbabwe has not changed much. I don't think colonialism can be easily shaken off an institution established, especially for those colonial purposes. So when you get to the National Archives, who greets you at the National Archives grounds? We here have out Alfred Bate, that is on the grounds of the National Archives. Alfred Bate was a friend of Cecil John Rhodes of German origin. They went to South Africa, uh, engaged in diamond mining and they were so successful, or lucky if I may say, they made a lot of money. Currently in Zimbabwe, uh, we have a lot, lots of buildings, especially in education, educational institutions, named after Alfred Bate. At the National Archives itself, we have a gallery uh, named after his name, meaning to say it is his estate, proceeds from his estate that is being used uh, for such good purposes, although the money was taken uh, in ways that cannot be uh, encouraged, but at least now it is being used for the good. So we also have the physical energy statue. You can find this in Kensington, London. Uh, it was put there, it was done by a man called George Frederick Watts. Uh, in Kensington, and one of these statues is at the National Archives of Zimbabwe. Um, it is there to celebrate the achievements of Cecil John Rhodes because in itself, uh, it's an embodiment of that courage, that, that ability to go that extra mile to achieve what has not been achieved before. Yes, the physical energy statue. So here, yeah, the physical energy statue uh, besides the man himself, Cecil John Rhodes. And during the period of Rhodes Must Fall, we were discussing on where the roads at the National Archives should fall, just like as he has done in other institutions like Cape Town. We were like, if roads fall, are we going to ban all these records? Because all these records within our building were a result of actions of this man. So putting roads down it remains a debatable issue up to now at the National Archives. I don't know what you guys think. All right, then coming to the proportion of records within the archives itself. The archives, uh, by far, it holds rec records, uh, colonial records more than uh, post-colonial records. They had been a century-long uh, administration that involved massive creations of these records. Uh, so that very, if, in, if we are talking in terms of percentages, less than 10% of post-colonial records are within the National Archives. Almost 90, if not more, are those of the colonial period. So examples of these records are death records of Rhodesians, Town planning records, title deeds, wills, mining claims, uh, newspapers, relics from historical figures, like the gun used by Courtney Selou to kill more than a thousand elephants. You find it in the gallery of the National Archives. And then this is the estate. We have this man called Mr. Johnson. He was a director of the National Archives for quite a long time. He earns a living out of researching uh, some information about on these documents on behalf of people in London, meaning to say much hasn't changed. 
Then there was the Native uh, Affairs Department. Oh, am I still within time? Yeah. The Native Affairs Department, which was established upon colonization in 1890 or so, that period, uh, it was responsible for the production of knowledge about Native communities. These documents were used mainly for administrative purposes. So this, this has always been the pattern all over the world that uh, upon colonization, the colonizer would try to understand whom they, they've colonized. So that was the case here. And in most cases, uh, the information produced on them is not accurate or maybe objective. Yeah, so Native commissioners and anthrop anthropologists like Michael Gelfand were actively involved in these efforts, trying to understand how they, they do their things, why they do this, and giving their own interpretations, which sometimes are wrong. So, the, this uh, Native Affairs Department had, had, had an annual journal which was called the Native Affairs Department Annual called NADA. Everyone who has been to the archives, uh, I'm sure, is aware of this NADA. It remained an important source of information about local customs. Uh, from when it was uh, established in 1923 up to 1980, it issued 57 uh, issues uh, and 912 <clears throat> articles. Many of the contributions came from officials of this department. Not all of this information is now found to be true. The article sounds very colonial in their descriptions, but nevertheless remain an important source of information. So its location is colonial. It's located in the elite suburb of uh, Zimbabwe. This is an area uh, formally prescribed uh, for whites only. Again, the colonial language is still dominant. All the records are in uh, English. Um, even the, the, the documents that are being currently uh, created uh, are in English. And you know how impactful a language is uh, in expressing culture. So there are some efforts to, to decolonize the archive. Uh, one of which is the creation of the community-based archive. Uh, the archive itself as the department is trying by uh, its best to ensure that there are archives wherever those documents are <coughs> created. So we have seen uh, community archives being created, in, for example, at schools, uh, in, at churches, uh, and even in those communities uh, which are uh, far away from, let's say, civilization in courts. So there is also an increased effort to generate oral histories, oral histories. Uh, which previously were considered as not useful or maybe objective, but now the National Archives is focusing on ensuring that they gather all the information from the older people living uh, about the past. So this is a good effort. But then the issue is the challenges of funding. Our former president decided to withdraw from the Commonwealth where much of the funding for be it personal training and um, the management and preservation of records themselves is concerned. And the reasons for this is Robert Mugabe decided to take the land back in means that were then thought of as not noble. He decided to just grab the land after he realized that through the normal channels, it might not be possible to get this land back to their rightful owners. So punishment was imposed. He was booted out of the Commonwealth, and he never cried about that. He just uh, moved out. 
And then the other issue now is brain drain. You train someone in the National Archives for five years, and he just leaves. I just left. So that's another uh, major problem that the archives is facing. So probably this marks the end of my, my presentation on the National Archives and my experience there. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lawrence. I wish when I had started my PhD research, I had had an overview like that. It demystified the process. Um, Chase, um, over, sure. over to you. Okay. Um, so my name is Chase uh, Barney. Um, as Brooks mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Arkansas. Um, when Brooks asked me to come speak, I wasn't sure exactly what I would share on, but um, the more he kind of made it apparent, like I've kind of had a unique experience. I'll say a challenging experience when it comes to um, conducting research as a foreigner, as a as a um, as an American at the at the National Archives, um, receiving that kind of long term. Uh, visa permission to study there or, or work in the archive um, was uh, sort of an arduous process. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, um, about what that process looked like, and maybe, as Brooks was just saying, uh, uh, some information I would have wished I had when I went into this process, um, because maybe if I'd had that, I wouldn't have done it to begin with, to be honest, but um, <laughs> with how difficult it turned out, not because of the process itself, but um, other obstacles I ran into along the way. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the research visa process. Um, I'm glad Lawrence gave a, a, a wonderful overview of what the archives uh, contain themselves, so I can just talk briefly about some tips um, uh, that I experienced or wish I would have known when I got there, and then reflect again on this, this idea of the archive as, as, colonial, uh, as a colonial creation um, and the problems it, it produces for us as researchers. Um, so I, um, I began this process in 2018. Um, as I was still just like preparing to take comprehensive exams, um, but I knew I wanted, I needed to go um, to the National Archives in Zimbabwe as well as some other places, and so I was trying to figure out how I was going to um, do that. Um, and this process, I had been advised at least, I knew it was going to take a long time. Um, I'd been told up to six months, it ended up taking more like nine months before I received approval. Um, so I knew I had to begin the process early. Um, the other difficult kind of catch-22 is that they, they want to know you have funding to go um, as part of the application process, but uh, you know I had to start that application process before I had even actually applied or received funding to go for this trip. So I had to kind of figure out how to navigate that. Um, so I applied for funding in early 2019, um, finally received it um, by the time I visited for the first time in, I guess it was August of 19. Um, and then I ended up making three subsequent, or two subsequent trips, three trips total, um, to visit the National Archives for a couple reasons. Um, I was supposed to be there for four months, five months, four and a half months. Um, in 2019, I had, a, uh, unfortunately, a death in my immediate family, so I had to leave after August to come home. Um, and so dealt with all that in my personal life, um, was excited to return, had to alter my dates with the National Archives, with um, the University of Zimbabwe um, to return and, and resume this research. Got there the first week of March 2020, really excited <laughs> um, to, to get back on, on, on track. Um, and a couple weeks later, of course, the archives closed um, and uh, I had to leave the country. Um, so then finally returned last summer in May um, to, to try to finish out this, what ended up being um, a process that began in 2018. Um, and, and was finally able to kind of finish the research portion in May of last year. Um, okay, so the application um, to conduct research is fairly extensive. It's this big, long document you have to fill out. Um, they want to know, and this is with the Research Council of Zimbabwe, which is this governing body that hands out these visas. Um, they want to know all the normal things about what your research is going to be about, what you want to look at, what your objectives are. They want to know you've done all the uh, background literature, um, what your methodology is. And a lot of this is geared towards, uh, you know, in the humanities, it's a little easier because we're not using, like, um, 
there's parts in there about methodology for like science research and agriculture and things like that. But of course, that didn't apply to me um, as a historian. Um, but they want to know all this. So you've got to fill this out. They want like, it was like 12 different copies of this I had to produce. Um, they want evidence of funding, as I mentioned. This, as I mentioned, this was difficult for me because I was still in the process of applying and hoping to win that funding. So I had to, uh, you know, say that I was going to receive funding that I wasn't totally sure I was going to receive. Um, and if I hadn't got it, um, either I just wouldn't have gone or I would have figured something else out. Um, and of course, the CV. Um, it's a $500 application fee, so you've got to have funds to um, foot that bill. And this is um, whether you get approval or not, right? You've got to pay this application fee. Um, the other biggest one is you have to have an, a Zimbabwean institutional affiliation. You have to be affiliated with an institution in the country as a foreigner um, who is sponsoring you, vouching for you um, to come and conduct this research. And then once you've gotten that, um, you have to apply for a temporary employment permit. Or I did. I don't know if others, I've heard of others that haven't had to do that, but this was the process they, they pushed me through. So I had to apply um, as a temporary worker um, to work in the country. So it's sort of a temporary employment visa and a research visa at the same time, or, or both. Um, so it was a lot, to say the least. Um, when it comes to an in-country affiliation, again, this is sort of the hardest part. Um, there are a couple different categories of institutions that this can be. Um, for me, I knew I was going to try for um, a, a higher education institution um, just because that's what I was familiar with working with because um, of my background. But these can also be government departments, um, uh, nonprofit organizations that have approval through the Zimbabwean government, um, government departments, and other research institutions. So you've got to have some kind of affiliation um, in the country people who will vouch for you. Uh, mine ended up being UZ at the Department of History, which is now the Department of History, Heritage, and Knowledge Systems. Um, and they were eventually uh, agreed to give me status as a visiting researcher. Um, this was a difficult process. My first um, <coughs> a few attempts to like, I, I didn't really have an in to the university to begin with. So I was kind of cold reaching out, trying to, you know, here, here's who I am. Here's the research I'm wanting to do. Would you be willing to sponsor me? Uh, no, I don't need any money from you. Um, and it took a while to get a response. Um, and eventually a change in leadership in that department um, kind of greased the wheels, I guess, to where they were more responsive um, and allowed me to um, receive this approval. So, but again, this was, I mean, this was several months of kind of back and forth waiting and trying to hear um, and, and crossing my fingers, hoping I would get approval until one day I woke up and I had an email and, and they had sent it to me. Um, so that's how I got um, this in-country affiliation um, that I needed for the application. So once I had that, um, you have to apply for this temporary employment permit, um, which includes your entire research application that you've submitted to the uh, Research Council, um, a separate TEP application, which includes a letter from that in-country employer um, or sponsor, CV, all your academic transcripts or certificates, um, a birth certificate or passport, passport photos that you have to include, um, proof of negative tuberculosis test. So I had to send a physical x-ray. I had to go to get an x-ray of my chest um, to prove that I didn't have TB. Um, and apply for this. And so this, this whole process um, ends up being this long chain of, of sending things through various um, uh, uh, places in Zimbabwe. So your institutional affiliation submits your research application on your behalf, saying we're sponsoring this visiting researcher um, to the research council. The research council will then run this through, um, technically I think it's the immigration ministry um, that approves these employment permits, um, who then sends it back to your institution saying, okay, we've approved this person as a worker. The research council has approved them for you to come. Um, and then together they can issue this research visa. So it's this incredibly bureaucratic process um, that took a long time, but um, ultimately I was able to somehow got lucky um, and prevailed through with some persistence. Um, and so by then I was able to um, arrive at the National Archive, um, a somewhat naive um, PhD student hoping to conduct research. Um, these are just some things I wish I would have known on my first couple weeks or first few days. Um, that 
you need to bring everything you need, right? Um, a laptop, pencils. I didn't bring a pencil um, somewhat naively thinking I could acquire one there and you could not. Um, you can't take photos of anything, so you have to type or um, my previous archive experiences had been in like London and stuff where I basically just took thousands of photos um, all day long. Um, and here I had, to, I had to write or type everything I wanted to, to keep. You can get photocopies, I think, but they're like a dollar a page or they were when I was there. Um, so only for very special things um, can you get those photocopies. Um, it is a traditional card catalog system. There's no digitization. Um, so you're working through to find the things you need. Um, the, the archivists there are quite helpful for finding the, the types of things you need, but you, you do a lot of digging yourself to find um, uh, uh, the documents you want or the boxes you want to look at. Um, you can reserve those between days, which is nice. I did not know that for several days um, uh, in terms of uh, working, continually working on boxes. But um, as Lawrence was able to give us, there's several different categories. Um, the public archives versus the historical manuscripts. Um, I was also able to find um, oral histories. There's an oral history section that, they've, they've, um, that there are transcripts of that you can read. Um, so those are pretty helpful for me as well. Um, but these different sections you can, you can navigate through. Um, and there are archivists there, there to help you as well. Um, okay, so just to reflect a little bit, um, my focus, um, as Brooks mentioned, is sort of on social history, a combination of labor and leisure history um, in the northern suburbs or the predominantly white suburbs um, in Harare in the late colonial period, um, mostly focusing on housing and development and how that plays into the racial divisions um, in those areas. Um, and in terms of my research, without going you know, much into my research itself, in terms of it, um, the archives are provided, I mean, essentially provided me with that colonial perspective, right? I mean, that's essentially all they've provided me. Um, it's local and national government records. It's business and housing development records um, of how these neighborhoods were constructed um, over time. Uh, neighborhood publications them themselves, one of the primary um, uh, groups of documents I found where most of these neighborhoods had some kind of, they call them village management boards. Um, either based around kind of neighborhood management or local government type settings um, or councils, I guess you could say. Um, but also church-based organizations um, that dealt with issues in these neighborhoods, right? And a lot of these, uh, I'll show you an example toward the end, um, deal with the kind of racial, racial divide and labor. Um, but most of all, mostly it's experiences and perspectives of right, re white residents, right? So it's either the colonial government or the ostensibly colonial population that has moved in. Um, into these places. Um, and, and that's really the only perspective you get um, from most of the archive. Even, the, even these oral histories I mentioned are mostly from white property owners um, or employers. So um, this is just a quick, couple quick illustrations of what I'm talking about. Um, Harare, or what was then Salisbury, um, was not, <laughs> the Rhodesians like to talk about how they weren't, it wasn't apartheid like in South Africa. Um, but ostensibly racially segregated suburbs in the north um, and to the northeast were reserved for white property owners um, and uh, the town townships or neighborhoods in the south uh, primarily for African workers. Um, but despite that, that, uh, you know, that division, this idea of white and black neighborhoods, um, an enormous amount of black people lived in these white neighborhoods, right? As domestic workers, as shopkeepers, um, as gardeners, um, all in the employment of white homeowners or property owners. Um, and so that's primarily what I am digging at is, is the experiences of these people um, living and working in these um, segregated spaces. Um, often, right, in, in very close proximity within the homes um, of, of um, white homeowners, right? So here's an example from Mount Pleasant. Um, this is a fairly affluent example, but uh, these, these, these wonderful uh, uh, single-family homes, um, you know, these neighborhoods afforded immigrants, white immigrants to the country, um, a, a standard of living, especially in the post-war years, that was not obtainable for even, you know, average British people, right, back in the UK. Um, 
and when the UK was still rationing until the 1950s, right, you could move your family to sunny southern Rhodesia um, and buy uh, a home you could not obtain in the UK for much cheaper. Um, often with a pool or a tennis court, these neighborhoods still are full of pools and tennis courts, um, have two cars. Um, and many times uh, a, a um, place, a separate property uh, or space on the property for a domestic worker that you could employ or multiple um, to also live at your home and care for your kids, cooking and cleaning. Um, gardening, all those different opportunities. So even in these white neighborhoods, right, these, these kind of 1950s, I mean, in a very um, global 1950s way of thinking about it, post-war boom way of looking at it, these, these shiny white suburbs, um, leafy green um, that are white areas, um, there's this very large um, black population that exists um, underneath that, right? Um, all that to say, None of this is, uh, you know, the perspectives of those people are not viewable in the archives um, by and large. Um, so here's just one example from one of these village management boards I was speaking about um, where, you know, they had a meeting and there was intense concern over the housing of, of, of course, what they would call natives uh, on land in these reserved European areas, right, these white neighborhoods. Um, uh, that, that basically their concern was that some people were renting out some of these spaces, renting out rooms or spaces out back um, to Africans um, who were not under their employment, right, um, to make extra income or, or, or rent. Um, and so they, they, would try to, they would try to enforce this. They would try to pass laws to police even their neighbors, right, that you shouldn't be allowing anyone to live on your property who isn't on, in your employment, right, or part of your family. Um, there's an, an, you know, this is somewhat stereotypical at this point, um, but um, intense uh, concern over, over their behavior, over loitering, over the kind of um, uh, movement of kind of unaccounted for um, Africans um, in these spaces, right? That they're going to be drinking beer and dancing and having, you know, parties and who knows what else they could get up to. There's a lot of concern over crime, even though there's very little crime. Um, that takes place. There's always kind of this fear of, of keeping a lid on things. Um, but this is just an example of what I mean, right? This, this is kind of this white perspective of what's going on in these places, um, this kind of over-concern about managing these people um, and, and not really, you know, there's never any perspective of who these people are, right? What, what they're doing, why they're there, um, or even how much they really are there. Um, so, the other half of my research deals with conducting oral histories, so that was kind of the rest of my time in Zim, was um, finding people who lived and worked in these areas, you know, older people now um, during this period who lived and worked and, and trying to find those voices and expose those voices and um, uh, next to the colonial record. So um, that's kind of all I have. That's kind of what I did at the National Archives. Um, and the uh, kind of experience I had trying to get that approval to go and do it, which was not fun, I'll say. <laughs> but ultimately, worked out. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you very much, Chase. I can uh, empathize based on my own experience. And I'm also envious. I tried to get my clearance to the University of Zimbabwe and they ultimately turned me down. So, <laughs> nice to you. Um, we have a good bit of, of time left. Oh, I think before I go any further, I wanted to uh, give a special recognition to the university's new director, Center of African Studies, who's on Kobo. <laughs> very much looking forward to, to having you in that capacity. Um, so, yeah, I think we can open up to. Any questions? Um, I guess maybe I can pose some while people gather themselves. Um, so Chase, maybe I wanted to ask you about this arduous process of getting the clearance. And I think that does deter a lot of people. Is that your assessment? I and mean, what do you think is the impact of that on sort of um, the historical research and academic outputs that scholars who are not in the are able to produce. Um, Lawrence, 
I would be interested, I don't know if you are at the level, to have any insights. I mean, what Chase was talking about is the Research Council of Zimbabwe. It's not, I don't think, really the National Archives. But are you able to give any insights on the relations between the two entities? And then, second question, um, much less formal, you talked about the colonial location. And that came to my mind. I think the archives is on something called Ruth Taylor Road. Do you have any idea who that was? No. <laughs> So uh, for the for the first question uh, on the relationship between the National Archives and uh, the Research Council of Zimbabwe, I don't know much about that, but I've heard many people from without Zimbabwe complaining about the delays of the Research Council, about the corruption there, and but I don't know much about the actual relationship. What I know is that as a researcher from without Zimbabwe, you have to get approval first from the research council, and then that approval is then signed by the director of the National Archives before you are given access to the, I don't know if that was the process, Chase? I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, so obviously, uh, it was difficult. I mean, difficult in the like, you know, I'm sitting at home, like sending a lot of emails and paper, doing a lot of paperwork. So that, that is the hard part about it. Like I said, the, the part with like trying to figure out, just as a student, trying to figure out and plan my funding situation, how it's going to go. The, um, you know, I had teaching obligations I had to try to get out of, um, all of these different things that I had to try to do just to get over there and try to do some research. Um, uh, didn't engender me to feel kindly toward my Americanist colleagues who were, uh, you know, could just drive to Atlanta and go to an archive. Um, so in that sense, yes, like, I mean, I think it's certainly a barrier. Um, at the same time, I don't know, I mean, how much we, we could have a discussion about, you know, how, how many white dudes from Kentucky do we need going to do, you know, research um, there. I don't know. but. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a barrier. It's very difficult. I'm not, I know I'm not the only person who's had, you know, have had trouble um, trying to navigate that process. So, um, and really, I didn't do anything special, right? There's nothing special about me. I just, I think I got lucky with the timing or whatever individuals I was working with um, uh, to, to be able to, to make it work. Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, Okay, thank you for your presentation. I greatly enjoyed your talk. Uh, I'm Pasmo, uh, I'm, a PhD, I'm a PhD candidate in history at Kent State University. Um, yeah, so I have um, uh, maybe one question. Uh, so how can these colonial archives, archives be decolonized? You talked of how they bring the colonial perspective and that they are, they are a colonial creation. So what could be some of the ways to decolonize this archive, uh, to both of you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, from my own perspective, I think it's outrightly impossible to like, decolonize the archive completely. But what is possible is to make some effort to ensure that what we have in the archive is, is colonial, is complemented by uh, like post-colonial information because as i say as i talked uh in my presentation there is more information which is logical because the the, the colonial system has, had been there for like a century and then now it is time for the post-colonial government and it has only been there for 43 years and within the national archives act of zimbabwe uh it states that the, the record can only become a public archive only after 25 years of its existence, right? So if we look at now, we can only access public archives at the National Archives of Zimbabwe. That ranges from those of, from 1980, when Zimbabwe uh, got its independence, up to 1998 all these remaining documents are 
still closed. They are still uh, being owned by the departments that, which created them. So probably the best way might be to gather information through oral means from within the communities around. So much effort has to be put on that. That might be the way to like realize a shift from colonial to post-colonial maybe. Okay. Uh, okay, I think you, yeah, I was thinking about the, the oral history project, like, like the, this aging, the aging generations, the older generations, like documenting their experiences and then putting that in the archive yes. to become archival information. Uh, that was, a, yeah, I think that's an important way of doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I would agree with Lawrence. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I think oral histories are extremely important. Um, and you know, with the ones that I, with the time period I was working with, I was already working with some fairly older people, right, whose whose voices will be gone um, in the next decade or so. Um, so, capturing those, putting those into the archive, they already have some projects like that. Um, I think go a long way to helping. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I agree too. It, to to some extent, you can. I mean, it is it, the archive itself is a colonial creation. And the documents there will be colonial documents. I mean, that's just what they are. Um, but you know, context goes a long way towards decolonizing things. You put things in the in the right context, you understand what they are. As long as you understand things as colonial, that's okay, right? Um, it's when we aren't able to understand them as colonial that they become problematic, or we we take them at face value without that context. Um, so whatever you know, there's a lot of a lot of things I think you can do to do that, but. At the end of the day, I think that's the biggest obstacle. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Pome, I'm Professor Pome Zondi. I'm a Fulbright a visiting scholar uh, in the African American and the African studies. Um, this is, you know, I've just been so. Uh, encourage listening to these two presentations because somehow it's very related to the history of my country, you know, South Africa. So um, my question, I don't know whether it's a question or whatever you want to call it, it's linked to the question that was just asked about, uh, you know, how do you think there could be decolonialization of uh, the archives? So, I listened to say here, talking about you know, language being one of the very, very important means of uh, 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 maintaining culture. And uh, when I'm a language person, I'm a literature person, I'm an oral uh, expert. So I was just wondering if, you know, you're talking about ways of uh, maybe decolonizing things, would uh, translating some of this material that is there into, I don't know, Shona or Debele, uh, I don't know what you want to be, uh, not be an ideal way of uh, uh, keeping this, because you know, the, the archives are very, very important. And, uh, I actually also liked your take. It was actually kind of a rhetoric. You said, you know, like in South Africa, oh, I say but you said some institutions, and I know that our institutions in South Africa are those some institutions. You know, in the uh, uh, roads must fall, sort of, a, you know, those hash roads must fall. So you said, and I like that, should it really fall, and blah, blah, blah. And I think this is really, quite a scholarly uh, issue because archives are archives and uh, otherwise how else is the future generation going to know about and I think this is very very critical and, cr and crucial in that for me personally you made it a rhetoric but for me personally I, I don't believe that uh, destroying such history is an answer instead so people need to work around, uh, you know, finding ways of uh, looking at post-colonialism and how can we 
take things from where they are, moving forward, correct them. Why? Uh, also trying to do something about the colonial uh, situation, whereby we don't just say, well, it was like this and so be it, but just to create the, the to keep the legacy, because I mean, these things are legacy, whether they are, legacies don't need to be something that we all like and love, but this is what uh, will be the wealth of uh, future generations. Now, if everything is, is uh, bent and what, 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 then what do we have to show for the struggles and everything? So that's why I said that what I'm saying, I'm not sure whether it's a question or it's a comment or I think it's, it's, it's a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Any reaction? Yeah, I think she is right because we have had such case uh, in, in, in DRC where the statue of Henry Stanley Morton was destroyed just because he did the, the most evil thing anyone can think of that cutting off people's hands for failure to bring back uh, in, enough rubber. But then they destroyed the statue. But how is someone born today going to know effectively how, what happened during that period? So I think I'm in agreement with what she has just said, that even if it's a bad history, we need it so that we can find better ways to chart our way forward. African and American studies um, for Chess. Yeah, yeah uh, my question for you is um, uh, you know, about content. You know, the, what you, you know, you showed a, a stick, a statue of a stick, I think. Francisco's. Uh, oh, the bird. Oh, the bird, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was very um, iconic. And people were tackled the um, picture on the currency uh, of the Federation at that particular time. <clears throat> but my, my question uh, about content is since things like that were actually looted, um, by the explorers and taken to various um, locations uh, in Europe, particularly. Uh, then, how do you balance that with your effort to go to Zimbabwe to go and access uh, things like that? When, in fact, a lot of those things uh, in European museums. And some of the European museums um, are very reluctant to return them to, uh, to their original uh, places. And for you, I, I didn't get your name, I'm sorry. Lawrence. Lawrence? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and for you, uh, my question, um, I think, takes off from uh, employees. And my question is uh, about the gaps um, that I think your presentation exposes uh, in the sense that the statues you're talking about, for example, Alfred Hayes, Sister Rhodes, and so on, tend to give the view that the history of Zimbabwe starts with the coming in of the Europeans. Um, and that's documented in those statues that uh, you are talking about. So there would be an argument um, that uh, both you and the woman seem to dismiss about uh, the hashtag road must fall. Because of that gap that um, I've articulated, um, because you said roads uh, came to Zimbabwe as a conqueror. You know, he came with the, 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 the um, a platoon of soldiers, the, the, the column. Yeah? And these have been celebrated because there's a statue of or the pioneer column yes. okay, indicating the capture of Zimbabwe. And even the landscape 
will be what they call it, the world's view. The world's view um, was coined by the local people, local chiefs. So, you know, this is a sacred place. But Six Roads is buried there as the last chief to be buried there. And after that, nobody else can be buried there. So, you know, then it, it creates those the gaps that I was talking about um, that would promote the roads as four type of thing because how, how do you celebrate the local uh, people? And we are Nehanga is the one who put up a fight against his roads. But she was a, she was a woman. Yes. And the British did not want to celebrate her because they didn't want to project the image that they were fighting against a woman gorilla. Yeah. Okay. So she's ob obliterated, erased. Instead, you have all these statues of this road. So my question is how do you address that gap? There are so many statues celebrating the colonization of the map. The, 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 uh, what you said about uh, Alfred Bates <coughs> being based in South Africa and moving to Rhodesia, just like Ford himself, is served by the link between Zimbabwe and, and the South Africa is that bridge. So um, uh, how do you address those gaps so that there's some acknowledgement of the local uh, people, the local resistance in Bianyahanda, from Bengura, and so on. How do you celebrate those um, in, in the face of uh, um, the dominance of the statues that celebrate the conquest of Africa? Um, well, OK, so as far as I believe you're asking how I kind of feel about the return of, of artifact, national artifacts, I mean, I think that's an interesting question because it, it sort of exposes as you were just talking about, a much larger issue, and especially, I mean, Africa as a whole, but Southern Africa is this, these ideas of competing identities and identity creation, you know, the formation of kind of nationalist identities in the region and the overlapping legacy of colonialism and kind of the, the, the extent of South Africa, even into Zimbabwe, um, along with the creation of Zimbabwean identity and, and this lingering Rhodesian identity that, that was around for a long time and is, is still in some ways. Um, so I think it's interesting, I mean, when it comes to national symbols and artifacts, I mean, you know, I, I think they should be returned, of course, but, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 it depends how far, I don't know how far those go to actually solving certain issues, right? Is just returning an item going to fix some of the problems? No, but it certainly, um, re, you know, helps place things in context again, right? This idea of decolonizing and contextualizing. Um, I think is the most important aspect. So, I'm, I, you know, yeah, I guess, you know, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. <laughs> yeah, on the issue of uh, gaps in relation to the, the statues, I think there, there is some kind of efforts to, 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 to close those gaps. The issue with uh, the stat those statues which I've talked about, they were previously in public spaces. For example, the Cecil John Rhodes one was in the main street of Harare, a public space where everyone can see him, and it sounds celebrating uh, colonialism in that way. And the physical energy statue was in Lusaka for a long time. So the effort of uh, removing those statues to where they are now, which are historical institutions. I think that was a great move. Now the case which you have, took, which you have raised of, what about our African heroes who helped significantly in liberating like Biani and Currently we have a statue that has recently been installed uh, along the same streets that uh, Rhodes statue spent decades uh, in the statue of Mbianyand. In Blawayo, we have the statue of, um, of Joshua Nkomo, which is uh, in itself evidence of effort to try to close those gaps. I think the only challenge is of on funding because many of these institutions, they've got very good plans 
be it to decolonize, to, to, to close such gaps. But the, the, the only remains, the only remain plans on paper if there is no uh, a, a funding backing behind. So the issue of finance, funding, is, is, is the major uh, issue. I have a question for uh, kids. So we're talking about sort of um, decolonizing the archives, and you're speaking about like going out and finding oral histories, and we've got a lot of questions. When this is just when these people aren't being represented in the archive, like what's the research process for like identifying and getting them before their stories are lost to time? Like how do we bring those people? How are those maybe from your time in the archive too, Lawrence? Like how are these people brought in to to provide these oral histories from someone who's not sure how that would be gathered? Um, and then what's the process for getting that into the archive so people can um, can learn about it? Um, I know for the ones that I, the existing oral histories that I read at the National Archive um, were mostly all part of a project, I think a project in the 80s and the early 90s to, to go out and, and record these. Um, so I'm not sure how that, how that agency decided on those. But um, from the ones I've done myself, I mean, again, I was, uh, you know, you know, a fairly new to this, um, working kind of in the dark, um, so to speak. So I, I just did a lot of networking. You know, I started with one, you know, knowing the people I knew in the country who had connections, and I worked my way. And and, and what I found was that when I found one interview to conduct, it often led to another because they knew somebody or knew of somebody, and were happy, you know, happy to to help me out. Um, so that's kind of how I went about it. Is just and. I think to the benefit of, you know, what I would argue the benefit of my work is that, you know, these are fairly just everyday people who were not expecting to talk to some random dude from the United States about neighborhoods in, in the 1960s. Um, uh, so in that sense, like, I think that's good. It, 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 I've been able to kind of illuminate those kind of voices. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's hard because it's very difficult to find people it's in, and, and um, you always have that. Any project is going to have a, a problem with the slice of slice of life it decided or was able to find or yeah. can you come again on this? Just in terms of how the oral histories were gathered at the, at the National Archives, you know, like the processes or like just how do people volunteer those or oh. discovered so those can be recorded. You know, I think that's a good interesting way to a good way to go about that. But it's just kind of like there's probably so many people, especially like Ferrari and these areas that have been affected by this, you know, how would they contribute their stories? Oh, for the National Archives uh, itself, it, it has like an oral history section. They organize themselves in, within that section. And most, most of the people they uh, interview, from my experience, are traditional chiefs. Yeah, they, 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 those are the major people I have seen myself being uh, people going after them to hear from them some oral histories. Yeah. This gentleman back here. Oh, yeah, so I think my question had already been asked from what he asked. Um, it was mostly about like what do how much do you have about the colonial period and also before that, did that actually be it's about African history? Because uh, what they're talking about like the governments, they're all like describing the lives and the experiences of white settlers, not like the indigenous people. Like how much is there like, indigenous people and their experiences because I think by balancing that that's why no matter with an actual thing about decolonizing colonization because it's the history of colonization so you can't decolonize that that's the way it is like you don't have to choose what's uh, good or bad when it comes to history I think we can talk about like the statues themselves like that's there's no debate like you can be separating assisting words on the street we acknowledge the history by taking that and put that where it belongs. That's like in the museum. In Ma, we also had the issue of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I think you probably heard about that. So they wanted to put uh, a special of him like, in the streets. Um, it's the same thing like, yeah, we acknowledge the, the efforts that he did to contribute to peace. And uh, we can do that by having the statue and putting it in the museum rather than putting it in the street because our history and what that means, it doesn't, if 
effects are being probably with the, the tra a trajectory of the country. So, like, for me, I think mostly in terms of like how much we have to put into archives that are actually document the lives and the experience of our people uh, to balance what they were experiencing. So, rather than just going to the archives and just uh, reading like uh, stories by uh, Dr. J.J. Livingstone and how he discovered Lake Mahawi, like, because that's how like we talk about history, like, that's when these people alive, like, alive in our countries. But people are already there, like, it's like Lake Mahawi was there before Dr. J.J. Livingstone came to Mahawi. Like, how much we have that document, like, the lives of people. So that's what I was interested in. Um, I haven't seen much uh, in the archive. Uh, of some accounts of African people from an African perspective. Mm -hmm. Actually, what is now like redressing that challenge is archaeology. Mm -hmm. There is now like a particular uh, focus mm -hmm. on archaeology now to understand uh, lives before uh, colonialism. Mm -hmm. we, we have had an issue of like Great Zimbabwe where its initial interpretations were just focused on proving that these local communities were incapable of producing uh, such elaborate structures. Mm -hmm. But now with, now with more objective um, archaeological approaches, it, it, it is now clear that uh, uh, such uh, achievements were possible uh, within these cultures. Mm -hmm. So maybe... I think greatness is there, like what we see in Egypt, because all the pyramids were built like a long time ago, so we you know. Yeah. All those couple, and people were capable, capable of doing uh, that long time. Yeah, so uh, in, uh, with regards to actual accounts, uh, there is none. There is none within the archive. Actually, the Native Affairs Department, although it was like. Uh, under uh, colonial control, <clears throat> it did a very good job in like extracting that information, which it did, no matter how debatable it is. But yeah. Uh, thank you both so much. This has been a wonderful uh, talk, uh, set of talks. I have so many questions. I'll try to confine myself. Um, so first, uh, Chase. I'm interested in what you thought you might find that you didn't find, and what you found that you didn't think you'd find. And then we're talking about sort of silences and what's not kept. Um, and then with your time spent uh, in colonial archives in London, like what ended up in London versus what didn't? And how did that uh, go into your kind of understandings of, uh, of colonial Zimbabwe? And uh, Lawrence, you made a comment about how uh, the colonial papers couldn't really be, of the Central African Federation, couldn't really be split up uh, with uh, and sent to Malawi and uh, Zambia. And I wonder, I mean, I can think of all the practical reasons why that is quite difficult, but I also, but I wanted to hear more about uh, the process of why that uh, couldn't, why that hasn't happened. Um, and then just more about, I mean, so many of the questions have been about oral history projects, um, but any, if there's, were, were there any sort of specific ones that were being carried out uh, during your time at the National Archives? And then I guess finally, you mentioned you were involved in manuscript deposits uh, from um, individuals, families, and NGOs, and uh, would love to hear about uh, one of those projects. I think our time is getting a bit low, so if there's any other questions, could we maybe just field those now, and then we'll end with you all answering a final round? No other questions? Anyone else? Advice? All right, John. Um, so what did, I, what did I hope to find that I did not? Um, I guess maybe naively, I mean, Contextually, as I hope to find more of those African perspectives or the perspectives of the people I was looking to you know, looking to learn about, um, and I didn't as much. I mean, a lot of it is 
it's not like they're not there, right? I mean, the, the Native Affairs Department, whatever, there's tons of information about all these people. I mean, of course, the colonial government, the minority government, is extremely concerned with what these people are doing and where they are and, and, and how they're doing it. Um, it's just you just don't have their perspective on any of it. Um, and so I think the amount that I'm just reading through, sort of the same accounts, you know, just dozens of this over and over, where it's just these kind of this paternalistic view of, of, of groups of people. Um, just over and over, it becomes repetitive, and at some point, not it's not useful anymore. Um, so I, I guess I hope to find more of that and did not. Um, there was a second part to your question, but I'm, oh, London. Um, uh, London was much the same. I mean, the stuff I went for, I, I went to Q, and 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 most of the stuff I looked there for was from the immigration department and how they were the Southern Rhodesian government was trying to sell the attractiveness of of, of bringing white immigrants to the country to live in those nice. Um, suburbs, uh, especially in the post-war era. So that's mostly what I was looking for. Okay, on your question on the federal archives, um, I'm not sure about why it has been a challenge, but from my own thinking is that uh, Southern Rhodesia was the capital of the feder federation, and these documents are in reference to the uh, running of the federal federal government, and for them being kept in the capital of the federation, I some kind find find it logical, because it's difficult to to break them apart to say this uh, for Malawi. These are you know it's difficult, and it's it's not only the issue of archives that that that, that is uh, posing a challenge. Our previous uh, president, Robert Mugabe, and Kenneth Kaunda it, it weren't in good box with regards to uh, inheritance of federal achievements. We have an example of the Kariba Dam, which was built during the federal government. It's benefiting whom? It's benefiting Zimbabweans more than uh, Malawians or Zambians. The, the, the infrastructure itself in Harare it was built partly by Zambian money. Our farms, Zambian people were there, Malawians. So it's not only an issue of repatriating archives, but rather repatriating uh, like what their Jews from the federal uh, achievements. And what the other question was, what was the other question? Your time working with oh, like the, the, the yeah. manuscripts? No, it, it wasn't like a project as such. Anyone who feel that he, has, he or she has this information, which might be of historical significance, is free to, yeah, to send that information or those documents to the National Archives. So in that case, it was just a guy who came with chunks of very good files on which my wife later on developed a master's thesis from. Could I just abuse my position to ask, so you mentioned about the white sort of extra Asians yeah. who have manuscripts they want to donate or preserve. Um, do you find, are there black Zimbabweans doing the same thing? Or is that just kind of Yeah, I've seen Zimbabweans too, like in the case of Mobin Mahach, I don't know if you know him, he was a former minister who died in mysterious ways. So uh, his parents and children brought like with diaries and information that is that that is some relation to government to Mugabe's ruling. Like yeah. But it's that only that single case from as far as I know, most of the cases are of uh, white Rhodesians who feel they might not be around in the near future. Yeah. Uh, yes, Professor Amfani. Uh, mine is not a question, it's, it's um, a quick comment. Uh, that's why I, I didn't run my hand when you said oh, the question. Uh, and it follows on um, the gentleman at the back here <coughs> about uh, David Livingston discovered in Malawi, but there's no statue of. Livingstone overlooking Lake Malawi. However, there is a statue <laughs> of David Livingstone overlooking the falls. And 
the Victoria Falls. So um, my comment is uh, also linked to what Pome uh, was uh, uh, commenting on about the language that may be um, the, that element of uh, decolonization, which uh, I think could be in the um, linguistic domain to say, should we uh, still call this Victoria Falls or uh, Mazvotunia? You know, find a local, since you're doing all traditions, right? Are there local versions? Because obviously the falls were there before the white men came. Yeah. What were they calling it? And can we go back to that? Um, and in a way, uh, you see here we had Wakanda, we had uh, Black Panther, um, which I don't know if you have seen it, uh, is a really powerful, uh, I think, discourse on some of the things that you were talking about. Uh, where presentation of the African past uh, has been very problematic even in the diaspora, okay? where most times there has been a perpetuation of the stereotype African. And so the first attempt to, um, the tourism type of African. So the first attempt to depart from that was with the, um, with the Lion King, okay? which again was oral tradition. But with Wakanda, which is actually filmed on the on, on the Victoria Falls, okay? um, there was that powerful um, attempt to maybe rename some of these uh, places. So one way would be you know to rename Victoria Falls uh, to a local language. Um, yeah, but that was my comment. So anyway. any, any final reactions? Yeah, well, um, thank you so much for devoting your Friday afternoon to this. Um, the second event in the Archives After Empire series, not on a Friday afternoon, I think uh, Tuesday, and it was April 18th at 11.30. Hope to all see you there. Uh, thank you so much.